what point will you, will, will you find support with the board, and what would you support them doing if it isn't collaborative in the way that you described? You, the first part of your question was, at what point will we do what? I'm yes, sorry. Will, will there be support from your groups, and if, if there isn't the collaboration that you described? We're willing to lend our support immediately, but the board has to take the um, step of, of uh, concretely engaging, even expressing that they want to engage the community. And again, what we believe is that it's important for the board to convene very well advertised uh, meetings in each quadrant of the city, and they need to use every resource at their disposal to make sure that we get out a broad cross-section of the community in order to begin the dialogue. That's just to start the dialogue so that, the, so that they, the board, can explain their ideas but also hear from the community ideas about how this whole process should go. And then we need to move to uh, a discussion about a uh, search and selection committee, if you will. And we need to identify the constituencies that should be a part of that committee. We know that some of those, are which we've already mentioned, such as parents and students and educators, uh, must be involved in the process. We imagine that there are other um, constituent groups in the community who would be a part of the process, such as the business community, political community, religious community, we imagine. But that's the board responsibility to identify those various constituents. However, we, we want to mention also that where parents in particular are concerned, it is not acceptable uh, past practice of uh, the board just sort of randomly choosing people and then uh, sort of assigning them uh, as our representatives. From our perspective, that's not acceptable. We have to talk about a democratic process by which parents have uh, opportunities to choose their own representatives. Talking about having like parents vote on who would be on this committee? Possibly, possibly that seems the, the most simple way. So that, for example, in those initial meetings, the board might call for any parent or other constituents who would be interested in serving on the uh, search and selection committee. And then at some point, we can imagine all of us going to one of the largest gyms at one of our largest schools and each parent, we're just talking about the parent process, we can't speak for other constituencies, um, each person who's interested in serving on the selection committee would give a, uh, 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 I don't wanna say speech, but explain to people their ideas about why they want to serve and their quote unquote qualifications. I mean, parents are automatically qualified by the fact that they have children in the system. But, you know, appeal to people for support. <coughs> and then yes, possibly a simple uh, process by which parents vote uh, for, to choose their representatives. Uh, excuse me, Howard. Hi, my name is Ernest Green. I'm a parent representative of SOTA. Um, I understand what you're saying, but the parent uh, involvement in the schools in particular is very low. So, so much time would be uh, taken away from getting things done if it's done that way. I understand what you're saying, and I really wish it could work that way. Um, to get on that particular parent uh, board, we had to be uh, recommended by the principal, and it's a commitment that a lot of times the people sitting around that table come up missing. So things, I think the, the caliber of the school, if you're gonna do it that way in a school in particular, I can understand it for the parents that are gonna make that commitment, Howard, because you know I'm new to Rochester and I see a lot of things are always we're gonna redo, we're gonna redo, and then a lot of time gets taken up and nothing gets done. So my concern is, like, uh, you can tweak it, but it's, it's, it's really not broken now. 
um, I think you can hold the parents that are there accountable, more accountable, I can see that. Um, but I really <coughs> hope we don't get into trying to redo things and waste a lot of time because there's a lot of serious problems going on with the schools. Nice. And like yourself, man. Ernest, we appreciate your comment. You see, this is an example of what might happen at the meetings. This is an example. We would solicit people's ideas and so forth. And we, like yourself, I'm a parent. I have two children in the system. Here's one right here. My daughter's a student at uh, Wilson Commencement. He's a student at 42. Um, and we want to be clear that we don't uh, take the position that we're dictating anything, but we have our ideas. We're sure other parents have ideas and so forth. This is why we're saying it's critical. The board should already be in, engaging in their so-called robust process. It's critical for them to start now. We, we, they should have started long ago. We believe that it's important to choose the permanent superintendent as soon as possible. However, we don't want to um, run roughshod over the process. We want to take the time to get the input of, of as broad a representation of this community as possible. We believe that that is critical, especially in light of this board's record as it relates to choosing superintendents in the past. And so that's where we're coming from. Not, we're, we're open, we have to be open to all community uh, members' perspectives. But, Howard, do you know how many you and, and Mary wanted to yeah, add I to wanted, that. I wanted to respond to that. Is it related? Or? Uh, no, it's an app. Uh, okay, a let me just respond real quickly. I just want to clarify that what we're talking about here today is a, you could call it ad hoc or temporary process for bringing parental representation and involvement into choosing the superintendent. So we're not talking about changing existing structures that are already in place in, in, this, in this press conference. That's not the topic. Um, but I also, you made me think that oftentimes uh, people will get involved in processes that are different like this that would not get involved in certain other processes. So we might actually see this be a catalyst for meaningful involvement where people might get excited and enthusiastic about actually having the ability to have a voice. I'm really optimistic about that potential. And just to respond to that, Mary. Well, well, well hold on, hold on, hold on for a minute, brother, okay. because we, we need to get... I just not, have a question. Hopefully we can stay here in dialogue afterwards, but we need to get the answers to the question that questions that the press have for us, and then we can stay in dialogue for until until they kick us out. Um, I wanted to ask you: uh, Do either of you know of any other urban school districts where they've used a search process similar to what you're talking about, where they didn't hire a search firm? Probably not, which would make us trailblazers, and we believe that's a good thing. We believe that's a good. In fact, we've been saying that all along is that uh, many of us have expertise. There are former retired teachers in the room. There are a few people who are still teaching in the room. You've got students, you've got parents, grandparents. We believe that we bring a collective understanding of this community, of the dynamics in this community and in this educational system that no search firm probably has. And so, no, we don't know of, of, of any urban school district that has done that. But that's a reason to do it, not to not do it. Not add to what you're saying. And to add to that, we have children who do not have transportation that are six, seven, eight years old that are required to walk almost two miles to school and over bridges. So the money that will be put into hiring a search firm why not put it back into one of the poorest districts right. where I'm That's right. That's where I was going. Good. Very good. Very good. Then it took the missus to straighten you out. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's okay. But see, that's exactly, that's exactly the position that we take. If you have $40,000, and that's the figure that they would use that they wanted to give to Ray and Associates, but we know the last time this process was done, it cost in excess of $100,000, according to your reports and the DNC's reports. And so that $40,000 is just a beginning number. We know as they begin to travel, as they begin to bring candidates in to interview them, they pay for the hotel expenses, the travel expenses. That's how we get to $100,000 or beyond. And so if we have that kind of money, it needs to go directly to the students in the schools. That's our position exactly. What other job 
do you get that type of like come here Perks. and if you don't pass you still got the hotel i've never seen anything like that i think we got enough talent here to search here and go out absolutely that's what absolutely. i believe we believe that we believe that the district should use its own human resources department and hopefully they're not making a statement that the human, re they call it human capital initiatives now. We remember Mr. Bazaar renamed almost everything. I don't know what was wrong with human resources, but we, we know what we mean by the way. Hopefully they're not making a statement that their own human resources department, vast human resources department, is not capable of helping in a search and selection process. We believe the idea that has been put forth by some of our allies in terms of engaging uh, college and university professors and their education students, particularly their graduate students, around helping with the research is the exact kind of creative and innovative thinking that we need to move to. So we think that's a totally legitimate idea. We, and we're willing to help do some of the footwork and so forth, but a problem is that the board is not talking to the community. That's a problem. And we need to talk, as of yesterday, as a first step. Well, I mean, I, I, here's another question for talking about the community. I mean, I remember last, I think it was June, I went to a school board meeting where people were invited to come and talk about the superintendent search process. Mary, I think you might have been there. And there were only maybe a dozen people who came to that. So how do you, in vision getting more people engaged. I mean, there are more people here now for this than there were for that. That's, that's, really that's, that's exactly the response that you see with a, you know, just a press conference, which was not an all-out organizing effort by any means. You see when people who are legitimately, consistently, and reliably working, not always with 100% success, but reliably and consistently with true commitment to work for change within our school district, you see the respect and you see the, um, the willingness to come and work together. Whereas, unfortunately, years, if not decades, of distrust, lack of commitment, lack of follow through, have resulted in people walking with their feet, voting with their feet, so to speak. So, the same goes for parent parental engagement meetings. They are, the board held earlier this year a parent meeting, and very, very, very few parents showed up. Yet we have parent organizing meetings with larger numbers. So it shows, I believe, and it's sad, the lack of trust or the lack of belief in the efficacy of the ability of our school board leaders and of our district leaders to actually work with the community, with parents, to accomplish something. So people don't have time, and, I, and I'm saying this with all sincerity and respect, people don't have time to come out to meetings where we know what the consequence and the where we're going with it, and it's not very far. So I think that's the answer. That and another aspect of it is their, the quality of their outreach. They haven't. It seems that they don't understand it to just put in the nut with all due respect to put an announcement in your newspapers that you know many of our parents and, and community members don't read your newspapers. That's just the truth of the matter. Don't read Minority Report. And so, so the quality of outreach is important. That's why we're emphasizing, if we're going to move to these meetings in each quadrant of the city, very well advertise that they need to use every resource at their disposal, their robocalls, uh, DKX, and everything else that they have, their newsletter. I believe they got a public access television station. They, we, there needs to be a real effort to reach out to parents. Sometimes it appears as if they don't want the involvement. That's how it appears, and we, now there's an example of, back to the question you asked earlier, where we're ready as foot soldiers. We'll help get the community out. We won't take full responsibility, but we'll help. That's what collaboration is all about. The, uh, somebody asked that we should mention that we do have uh, ideas about the, we, we believe that part of the process must be once the collaborative search and selection committee is put together, one of the first tasks of that committee should be to identify a criteria that we're using to search for this person. 
We have some ideas, again, we're not attempting to dictate, but we believe that there are solid ideas about some of the factors that uh, would make a good superintendent at this particular point in time in this particular community. For example, we believe that we should be looking for a person who's an instructional expert, someone who has experience teaching. We think that's important. Someone who has experience, proven experience, not on paper, engaging and working with urban populations. And when we use the term urban populations, we're talking about, we mean everyone, students, parents, community members, labor, all of those uh, various um, uh, constituents, constituencies. The ability to, re to build consensus between labor and management, parents, and the broader community is important. Someone who's accessible, who's readily accessible to the community. In a, in a nutshell, all the things that Jean-Claude Brazard was not. Those are, that's some of the criteria. We're not saying this is a conclusive list. In fact, we have other, other ideas, but we're anxious to hear what ideas our board uh, have. You, you talked about the mistrust, but do you think that some of the mistrust is um, really about ideological differences, not so much that you distrust one side or the other? If you take just, for example, the issue of mayoral control, which really hasn't gone away, um, you have a different point of view than a large portion of the community has. How can you come together on an issue uh, such as hiring a superintendent when you have such deep differences on that level? Because that may come to fruition and the person that you select may end up not reporting to the board, but reporting to city council and the mayor. What? Well, oh. just, just a, a quick, I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure what you said about um, public opinion about mayoral control, but I just want to set the record straight that there is no doubt that the majority of city school families are opposed to mayoral control or centralized forms of control that would eliminate a school board. That's unequivocally yeah. clear. Yeah. yeah. True, so, so, but, but that's not the major point. I just want to uh, right. So, yeah, there are political differences, but I want to address the question about ideology and um, the reality of parents and and the trust issue. It, this is this is how I understand when we talk about ideology. Let's not make it abstract. Let's talk about market-based reform agenda and what that means. What what imposing a business model in public education means. What it means is taking business models and applying it to public education, making schools into factories more than they than they already are, <laughs> and talking about the search for profit as opposed to developing competent, critically thinking individuals who can reach their dreams. So that's ideology. When we, we really need to address this, as abstract as it is and as you know, a side issue it may feel to people, that is ideological. Imposing corporate reform agendas across public school systems, especially urban school systems in this country. Now the reality from the ground, from a parent who is in a setting where administrators do not want parent involvement, like Jean-Claude Grizard, that's how it works out in the real world, is being shut out, voices being silenced. That's how ideology works out for real people. And real people don't like it. Whether they name it as being opposed to a corporate reform agenda, or whether they name it as, my voice is being silenced, my school is being closed when the administrator didn't even know until a Sunday news report. That's the reality in the real world. So when we talk about trust, People are not fools, people experience reality, and yes, it's connected to ideology. Also, don't, you have to be very, very careful not to begin to mix issues. We're talking about collaboration between an elected board and a broad community, not assemblymen. I mean, I, we imagine they will be in the mix, but it's the board's legal right and responsibility to choose a superintendent, not an assemblyman's. Not Assemblyman Gant, not Assemblyman Morelli, or any other Assemblyman. It's the board's right and responsibility to choose the superintendent, and it's our right and responsibility as parents, as educators, as grandparents, as students, as all of those constituencies to be involved in the process, to have input in the process. Now let me say something about mural control, because there's still a lot of rumors floating around about what mural control is and what it isn't. What it isn't 
is it's not a governance system that there's any credible research anywhere on earth that shows that it is any more effective than an elected system of uh, governance. As a matter of fact, the best performing urban school districts in the nation all have elected boards. Now, let me tell you what else. Uh, some, what else about that? Let me mention a couple other things that are important about mural control forms of governance. There's too much power in the hands of one individual. Across this nation, wherever you go, across this nation, and particularly Chicago, the Rahm Emanuel and Jean-Claude Brazard combination, a reporter just called this from Chicago today, We're talking about mentioning the upheaval that's about to occur in Chicago as we sit here. Those uh, urban school districts that have mural control as its form of governance, you have massive uprising by parents and community members. And what's their major complaint? That there are no mechanisms for them to engage. And so we reject it for that reason. We also reject it because it's an undemocratic concept, the idea that you're going to take people's rights to choose their local representatives away, and we do not buy this argument that people keep trying to spin that, oh, you still have the right to vote for the mayor and for the city council. Well, we're, some of us are not that good at math, but we know 17 is larger than 10. We, you understand? We understand that if you take away our right to choose seven of our local representatives, we've just lost something. And so we know 17 is larger than 10. And let me say this. From some of our perspectives, it is a potential throwback to a Jim Crow system. So that if you have in Monroe County all the surrounding public school systems where people have a right to choose their local representatives, but it just so happens in the metropolis that is uh, <coughs> more so <coughs> people of color than any other uh, school district, you don't have that right, that begins to resemble the old system of Jim Crow. So we think it's a dangerous road to go down, and uh, the fact of the matter is, something that's still baffling to us, there were only two of the seven school board members who supported mayoral control. And you may recall, we called for their resignation, because they were saying, uh, basically, that they're not competent to do the job and that they need to be taken over. And so we didn't understand that. For us, the only logical thing to do was to say they need to resign because they're admitting that they're dysfunctional. So we continue to oppose mural control for those reasons. Excuse me. Can I just make an announcement about the meeting? Yep. I'm a member of the, I gotta go to the of the parent council, and we sat with the superintendent last night. And I'm on October 21st, at 7.30 at Central Office, he's inviting all families, community needed meet people, preachers, anybody in the community to come to his office and they're gonna do like a reach out. It's about 600 children were absent from school yesterday alone. So they're planning on doing a going to the door, knocking, teaming up. So if anybody wants to uh, be involved in that, Give the superintendent's office a call uh, by tomorrow. Thank you. Let Appreciate know. It. It's going to happen on the 21st on Friday, 7:30. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering why um, why school board members would want to hire a firm to a corporate you know firm to <clears throat> hire a new superintendent um, where the current board. Presum presumably uh, supports mineral control where they, as Howard just mentioned, don't feel uh, uh, you know, don't feel competent enough to be in those positions. Like, wh why, why would they go to Rain Associates? Do they really not want their jobs? Like, what, what is the underlying current here? Like, I mean, I was at the meeting like a couple weeks ago where, you know, you guys basically prevented a vote allowing this where, you know, you were, you were, you know, calling out Malik Evans and the board saying like, what are you doing? This is messed up. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, like just speculation here, but like, what do you think their underlying mentality is on those, on, on, on allowing mayoral control, which would effectively destroy their jobs, eliminate their jobs, and hiring a, a firm that 
believes in that kind of construction to find a superintendent that would work within that system of mayoral control and I don't know. This is a mind boggling well, question. <laughs> I don't I, I can't first of all let me just acknowledge that right, I can't right. mind meld with the board members and I and I wouldn't presume to to um, to know for sure. But I'll I'll make a guess, you know, an educated guess based on attending many board meetings and knowing the board members individually. Um, I suspect that they don't draw that conclusion necessarily. I don't know that they conclude that hiring a corporate search firm is, you know, really in line with a corporate agenda that often seeks mayoral control. Corporate agendas in uh, urban schools don't always go the mayoral control route. Sometimes they go a state um, control board or other forms of centralized control or other ways of weakening democratically elected. Um, school boards that really represent the communities in which the um, schools are in. Um, so I think the reason, the, the best guess I can make is why they seem to be interested in doing it is because it's, well, Melissa Campos was quoted as saying that it's best practices. So again, you know, we need to deconstruct this language. What is best practices? You know, this is, this is whose best practices? The Broad Institute, you know, corporate think tanks, who are funded by billionaires whose interest is in extracting private, you know, profit from our public education system. Yes, that's that's the connections are right there. They're they're very very clear. So you know, hiring a private corporate search firm, especially that type of search firm, um, is definitely right in the realm of Eli Broad, Gates Foundation, Walton Foundation, and people really, you know, we really need to understand this. So. And also I think it's lack of imagination, I'm sorry to say, lack of imagination, lack of willingness to work really hard to struggle with a vision. You know, we have a vision, I have a vision of how a community process could work. People I know who could, you know, be involved and who know others and know others and know others in our community. But, um, you know, that takes some work, it takes imagination, and it takes um, kind of courage in a way to break outside of what is called best practices by others. And, and it becomes clear that apparently they don't have vision. You, if you recall, they were, this board was very proud of themselves for having chosen Jean-Claude Brazard. And they boasted, they actually boasted about it. We've chosen a, a world-class leader and so forth. See, so you see, they really believe that that's best practices and so forth. That somebody like Ray and Associates is gonna find the best superintendent in the world automatically. Why? Because they're Ray and Associates. You, you understand? And so they are, it appears, visionless beyond the conventional wisdom of what's called best practices. Can we take this question then? Yes, uh, the question that I have is like, I'm wondering why is it that there can't be the input from the community to look within our own pool right here within Rochester so, because there are a lot of candidates that have put time in the field, that have been working with kids, and I do feel that there are people qualified right here within this city itself that has put in time. That, I mean, if, if we would allow them to run and, and to be able to participate in the vote, I, I think that we would actually, instead of taking and spending that money elsewhere to look for somebody in another state to go abroad, this and that. I think the money needs to be spent right here. Yeah, we, in, in general, we agree with you. We don't even believe the money has to be spent at all, at all. That's what we're saying. We can do a collective process with at minimal cost. That's what we believe. We don't believe that local people should be excluded. However, we don't believe that that alone is the criteria to become the superintendent, but we view it as a plus. We said that that you're more likely grounded in an understanding of the dynamics of this community, the politics of this community. The ch you have more of an idea of who the children are, who the parents are, who the educators are. So we think that, that sh that's a plus, but it can't be, that can't be a sole criteria, but it should be, a, from our perspective, a part of the criteria. Yeah, Mr. Macaluso's yes. yes. question, and then we have to shut it down. Sorry, okay. we have, right. we have okay. Mr. Macaluso, and then we have to we, we don't have access to the building. How, let me let me say though, we we normally meet every Tuesday at 5:30 at 350 Chalai Avenue. So we're going from here over to our meeting. People are welcome to join us there. 
over at the um, St. Stephen's St. Episcopal Church on Chai Lai. 350 Chai Lai Avenue. We can continue this discussion there if you'd like. I just have a question. Um, it, it sounds as if, you, um, from what you've said and some of the things you've talked about in the past, that you presume that the uh, prior search firm was the search firm that actually hired the corporate superintendent that should be Jean-Claude Broussard, am I right with that? No, they don't hire, it's board hires. Well, they the board recommend hires, it. I mean, the, the bat, the bat. They recommend it. They recommend it. They absolutely did. It's my understanding that that's not completely accurate. Mm -hmm. And one of my questions to you is, where does the RTA fit in this? Because it was actually Adam Urbanski well, who introduced Jean-Claude Broussard. I saw, that, uh, I saw that statement, I believe, in your paper, where the president of the board actually said, now listen, this is important, this is very important. It, the president of the board actually said, I believe in your paper, you may have written a report, that this superintendent was recommended by, how did he put it, a community member, I believe he said, and we all know he was talking about Adam Urbanski, and we all know Adam Urbanski knew Jean-Claude Bizarre before, he, we're not, we know that, we know all of that, but do we have the president of the board saying that we allowed the president of the union to make the recommendation in terms of who we chose, I hope that's not what we, I hope that's not true. But when I saw you, I think it was your report, Mr. Macaluso. I was absolutely baffled. I meant to call him up and ask him, "What do you mean by this? Are you saying that the person who really made the recommendation that you accepted was the president of the union? Is that what you're telling the community? If it is, you need to resign too." <laughs> well, I don't. So, so we we know we know that. I, well, we don't know for certain, but we've heard what you've heard, that Dr. Urbanski recommended Jean-Claude Brazard. We we have heard that. We don't know that to be a fact. However, our bottom line is, it is the board's legal right and responsibility to hire the superintendent. And if they were wise this time around, they really would create opportunities for quant quantitative and qualitative input from parents, from educators, from grandparents, from students, from every um, stakeholder in this community. That's really the bottom line. Yes, sir, thank you. And by the way, I don't know if you want to write it in your reports or not. We will probably make it clear to the, electron the major electronic media that they will not just continue to ignore our efforts. That it's gone on long enough. I don't know if you want to put that in your report or not. Uh, absolutely. Um, what is your plan for student involvement in this select, selection committee? I'm glad you asked. Because we, we feel that for, from parents' perspective, there must be some kind of democratic process. You heard me talking about people choosing to serve and then going to the gym and making their speeches and so forth. We think the same kind of process should happen for students. We don't believe that the board should handpick the students. We believe that you should have a democratic process However, we don't want to dictate to you what that process should be. But what we're willing to do, and you probably came with Mr. Pickley, so he's probably willing to, to work with you. To, to Let's do it however you believe it should be done. But we believe that there ought to be some democratic process by which you choose your representatives, as opposed to allowing somebody to dictate to you who's representing you. Does, does that make sense? So get together and talk to us and let us know how we can help. But it, we believe ideally whatever process exists for parents is sure that your, the process that exists for students should be reflective of that. With the idea being that it's, it's a democratic process. That everybody who wants to be involved has a chance to be involved. Yes. This will be the last one that tells us we gotta go, right? We, we gotta go, we, our money ran out. Oh, the, o the only <laughs> point I was gonna make is that implicit with this, this suggestion, which I think is kind of an out of, out of the box idea, would be what if the superintendent were elected by the community? You know, it'd be kind of interesting to have the, uh, the, the polarized positions out there in terms of, you know, I'm in favor of this, I'm not, you know, what does the community want? It'd be interesting in terms of looking at it. I don't know if people realize that there are some school systems that have yeah. elected superintendents. So that's the thought. That's the thought for us to entertain.